Welcome to Yung Tuition. I am Yung. I will try to keep my voice down a little bit to generate some resonant baritone. What do you think? I used to give lectures for over 200 students in a big uh, lecture theater without using microphone. That's why I easily speak too loud at high pitch. Today, I will discuss Arrhenius climate model again because it seems the IPCC relies on his uh, predictions for the climate sensitivity amended in 1906, not the one he published in 1896. Therefore, it is necessary to evaluate the assumptions used by Arrhenius in order to obtain a full picture. So are you ready? I mean to like, to share, and to subscribe, as well as to activate your little bell so that you wouldn't miss any of my new talks on weather change and climate stability. Let's go and have fun. Around 4000 BC, Democritus said the universe is made by atoms and the void or vacuum. Atoms starting from Dalton's atoms in 1803 have gradually become known to many people, but it would appear that the concept of vacuum remains obscure. Before 1661, almost nobody could really understand the existence of air as if the space were empty near the surface of Earth simply because air is invisible and basically intangible. What's happened in 1661? Using his newly invented water pump, a pair of metal hemisphere that can form a perfect vacuum inside a sphere, and 16 strong horses Otto von Goritzsch, for the first time in the human history, demonstrated to the public some dramatic difference between the space with air and that without air, called vacuum. The experiment revealed that the atmosphere is made by large quantities of compressed air. 99% of them are nitrogen and oxygen, as it has been known and is naturally structured by the gravitational force first formulated by Isaac Newton. So bear in mind, the atmosphere is primarily a mechanical system in which gravity plays an essential role, as pointed out by one of the viewers recently. Look at the vertical exponential distributions of the air density and the air pressure in this U.S. standard atmosphere. Notice that the air density and air pressure are always at their maxima at the condensed matter surface of the Earth. In fact, the air temperature near the surface can be accurately calculated by using gas law based on the pressure and the air density near the surface, as shown here. In other words, the surface temperature is independent of the CO2 or any other trace gas concentration in the atmosphere. So by and large, that's how the present surface temperature is determined rather than by the so-called greenhouse effect. In other words, the surface temperature would be the same in the absence of CO2, unlike what was predicted by Arrhenius. Of course, I can discuss this in detail if you are interested in, but please don't get very excited. After all, this is my study room with a window to the public. On the contrary, this is not surprising as the thermal state and the total energy of the atmosphere is essentially determined by the sun of the kinetic energy of every air molecule. In essence, the thermodynamical processes in the troposphere are determined by the air, all of them, rather than 0.04% of them. 
Think about the general circulation. Think about dust smoke from the volcanic eruptions, and of course, think about weathers, including extreme weathers. All of them would disappear without a trace in the absence of the air. This implies that if you only consider CO two and water vapor molecules in the atmosphere, then you are not studying the real atmosphere at all. This is something important. Before we go further, in history, however, several physicists, Fourier in particular, had been puzzled by the diurnal variations on the surface between the Earth and the Moon. They argued that infrared radiation absorption by certain gases in the atmosphere should play a dominant role in keeping the Earth's surface from the radiation cooling, similar to that on the Moon. In short, they don't think air can keep the Earth's surface temperature stable. In 1860, Tyndall first observed both water vapor and CO2 can absorb infrared rays, but he didn't measure the absorption spectrum. Therefore, the selective absorption were unknown. He speculated that water vapor might be the major driver for climate change, without considering other air molecules. In 1896. Arrhenius proposed his pure radiative climate model to predict the dependence of the surface temperature of the Earth on the CO two concentration close to zero point zero three percent. Then, to be specific, he showed that the surface temperature could decrease or increase over five Kelvin if the CO two concentration were halved or doubled, respectively. As I discussed before, Arrhenius simply described the atmosphere as a single layer above the surface, separated by vacuum, as if low air existed in between. In this way, he allowed both the surface and his single layer atmosphere to absorb and emit infrared rays, so that he could derive his formula for the surface temperature at radiative equilibrium. What's wrong? You might say. One thing is certain: Arrhenius was certainly not deal with the real atmosphere made by all air molecules. In particular, he ignored the fact that air near the surface are in thermal equilibrium with the surface, in order to build his、uh, climate model based on thermal radiation only. In 1906. Arrhenius was obliged to admit his early predictions are incorrect, although he insisted that his climate model be used to predict the surface temperature using new and concrete observational data. As early as the ancient Greek, Aristotle knew vacuum is quite different from the space with air. The terra abhorre vacuum. Or nature abhors vacuum. Today we can see Earth's surface abhors vacuum. Aurelius abhors air. In reality, however, the air is a physically inseparable part of the Earth's surface, and always share the same temperature at their interface. Because there is no such a vacuum layer in between at all, and hence there should be no thermal radiation by the surface. That is desperately required in the greenhouse effect formulation. Think about it. If you sit on the chair for a while, you will find the temperature difference at the contact interface is zero. Unfortunately. Climate researchers often ignore this fact, including Professor Happer and his former PhD student. In passing, it seems strange Happer has been named as a denier for climate change, although he wholeheartedly agrees with Manabe's work 
based on the greenhouse effect hypothesis. In fact, the calculation by the two Williams are very close to those without water vapor feedback endorsed by the IPCC. In summary, the Earth's surface is full of highly compressed air as first demonstrated by Otto von Garik. It is terribly wrong for Aurelius and other climate researchers to assume the surface can radiate infrared rays in the presence of the air. And the surface temperature can be accurately determined by the air density and air pressure in respective of CO2 or any other trace gas concentration in the atmosphere. Thank you for watching. Thank you for donation. See you next time.